Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Myra Banner, and on behalf of the IMECI's Construction and Building Services Division, I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to today's webinar on engineering data centers. We are joined by two experts in the data center industry, Gerard Thibault and Alex Dorn. They're going to give us a brief history on data center development and discuss a brilliant case study covering some of the modern engineering techniques surrounding this industry. After Gerard and Alex's presentation, we'll have time for a Q&A. So throughout the webinar, please feel free to type in your questions and we'll try to get through as many of them as possible at the end. So now to introduce our speakers. Gerard joins us from KO Data, a company that has been developing and operating advanced data centers for high performance co-location since 2014. As Chief Technical Officer, Gerard oversees the technical design and construction of all aspects of the data center. He draws on over 40 years of experience within the electrical engineering industry, and more specifically, 20 years as a technical thought leader within the international data center sector. Alex joins us from Future Facilities, a software development and engineering consultancy firm that brings virtual prototyping to the electronics and data center industries. Alex's 15 years at Future Facilities has seen him provide designers and operators with innovative performance analysis and advice around data center cooling systems. He has a background in mechanical engineering and IT systems and has been managing the UK's engineering team for nearly a decade. It now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Gerard and Alex. Thank you, Mara, and welcome everyone to the presentation. I'm just going to give you a quick run through the agenda. Uh, so we're going to start off with a quick introduction to data centers um, and then talk about the KO vision and what KO data set out to do when they embarked on this project. Then we'll talk about the engineering disciplines involved in the data center industry when designing and building. And we will take our first look at how the energy is used and where efficiency gains might be found. Followed, following that, we will take a quick look at the technology that serves the operations, and finally, how simulation has helped, to, helped secure an efficient design with the KO data design process. So over to Gerard for the introduction. Thank you, Alex, and uh, Myra for the uh, introduction there. Um, going to start at a relatively high level just to introduce the idea uh, of the data center. Um, a lot of people until uh, the last few years may not have even uh, known data centers exist, um, but um, we're very much in the, the thick of it for uh, quite a while now. Um, the, to a lot of people, a data center is probably just a black box where a lot of computers sit, um, and um, I guess that's all it needs to be. Um, the, there's a vast range of data processing facilities out there in the market, um, starting from your server room or even broom closet, right through to um, what we call on-premise data centers, smaller data centers that a company might have, um, large co-location facilities like the ones we develop, or large hyperscale data centers, uh, such as the Google uh, platforms and Microsoft platforms that everybody's sort of aware of. Um, data centers really, um, to the user, are a black box. And it, what's really important is the ratio of inputs and outputs in terms of energy and heat, uh, and data. Uh, and one of the things we'll touch on today is the ratio of energy, the sort of benchmark that we look at. Um, and between myself and Alex, we'll introduce PUE, uh, power usage effectiveness, uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, one of the key things we need to do is minimize the risk of downtime uh, to the services. Uh, we all expect in this modern day, uh, everything to be available all of the time. So availability is the key uh, element for data centers. Um, and really, that's the reciprocal of unavailability. So downtime is bad for us. Um, so everything is sort of really engineered with industrial sort of grade architecture, uh, electrical and mechanical, uh, to support that. Moving on to um, the next slide, if we can. Um, Data Center Heroes and Villains, uh, an interesting title. Um, the, in the press, we often get a lot of um, bad feedback about data centers and um, uh, 
the amount of energy they use and so on. But I think it's worth considering that actually they, they are the sort of heroes of our modern um, world. They sort of really underpin all of our technological innovation. Um, you know, a lot of what uh, we've seen at our data center is sort of high performing applications uh, running lots of things that help us run our lives. Um, more recently, um, with the pandemic, um, they've certainly, uh, with one of our customers who looks into uh, medical research, they've managed to support a database that then feeds into a supercomputer, which helps research into the disease and um, vaccines and so on for it. So um, absolutely critical to uh, what we do in this world. And really underpinning that, um, just at the end there, um, Without it, we wouldn't be having this um, conference now, uh, and we wouldn't be able to work at home on platforms like Zoom, um, Microsoft uh, Teams, and so on. So they're absolutely uh, critical for us. Um, on the villain side, yes, they, they do use a lot of uh, energy and resources. So um, one of the things that uh, is important is to try and uh, be on top of that. Um, you know, one of the, the points often made in um, the press is that data centers use more uh, or create more emissions than planes and um, shipping and aviation altogether. Um, and I think it's important to, to make sure we compare apples with apples. Um, clearly, uh, using a data center and a, a video conferencing, you know, there is an irony there that um, it saves everybody flying all the way around the world to have a, a large meeting. Um, I was uh, last year I was in Hawaii with hundreds and hundreds of people with huge amounts of air miles and a lot of that could have been done via uh, video conferencing. So um, what we're going to look at is is how we uh, get around that, um, talk about some of the, the legacy data centers and how they have perhaps performed less well uh, in, in history, uh, but really look forward to, to being more sustainable. We could go to the next slide, please. Right, the KO data vision. Well, um, I guess the the vision is that we want to be uh, recognised as a, a against an industry benchmark as being one of the best data centres, both in performance, but also um, commercially, uh, and also uh, in terms of sustainability. Um, if we look at the campus that we've built um, on the screen, there you'll see. Um, a series of four buildings, uh, very similar to the uh, the building up on the uh, top uh, left-hand corner. Um, so we're building at, at sort of industrial scale. Um, if I look at the, uh, the the sort of headline figures from the campus that we've established, um, that gives about 40 megawatts worth of um, capacity. And I'll, I'll sort of put that in perspective as we go through the presentation. Um, and we have a spend of around about £240 million by the time we're complete. Um, Open Compute Ready, um, for those of you who don't know, Open Compute Foundation was put together by people like Facebook and Microsoft, uh, and they sort of lead the way in which um, hyperscale has um, driven sustainability, and, and we're very keen to follow that. Um, in terms of our focus, we, we really look at um, everything we can do, certainly 100% renewable energy, um, and also uh, driving down the PUE that we mentioned on the first screen. Um, I think with that, um, I'll hand over back over to Al and um, uh, talk about some engineering considerations. Thanks, Gerard. Okay, so for me, um, my experience of this industry is that you're always close to engineering and engineers um, and a data center really is the product of many engineering disciplines and for me this has kept my job pretty interesting and there is an awful lot to learn. Uh, all of these different engineering inputs that you can see on the screen need to come together and they need to work in harmony and that's essential during the construction phase uh, where everything has to be clearly specified for the construction to proceed. However, once in operations, uh, efficiency can suffer. We, we do see that, and it's because primarily it's very hard to measure and therefore very hard to manage the efficiency. Uh, 
Um, and as a result, performance loss during operation compared with, des compared with design is an accepted part of running the data center. It's, it's par for the course. But this is where we need to focus. So, Gerard, I think you might want to take yeah, through sure. the Absolutely. The so, timelines. running a, a project like this, um, it requires a sort of a laser focus to make sure, from an investment point of view, we start earning um, revenue from the building as soon as possible after we've committed to the design. Um, generally, uh, as I'm sure most people are familiar, we work around the REBA stages of work. Um, so we have a strategic definition, um, preparation, and briefing. Because we try and adopt, a, a, the Americans perhaps call it a cookie cutter approach, um, and as you will have seen on the campus, we have four buildings that are identical. Um, a lot of the, the early work on the repeat um, builds um, gets reduced in time. Um, but when we come to going through the concept and spatial considerations, um, it's always worth folding in uh, experiences that we've learned through projects. Um, so we still usually have a design time that, that's probably sort of three months up front of actually being able to start uh, on site and start manufacturing or, or producing the data center. Um, one of the, uh, the sort of key things that we, we think about um, is how can we order things earlier um, when there's such huge demand in the market um, to make sure that we, we get the, the timelines that we need. Um, you know, we, we've probably got two to three years in planning for a whole sort of site and a building um, in terms of getting planning approval, getting power. We're looking at 12 to 18 months to actually put the shell up and do a, an internal fit out and then subsequent fit outs are anywhere between six and nine months. So anything we can do to advance um, delivering equipment on site uh, is hugely important. And that's really the key to us using things like um, building information modeling, BIM and CFD, uh, computer fluid dynamics to uh, really sort of predict what our designs are going to uh, give us. And then based on that, place orders for equipment which can be then running uh, in production in parallel with the rest of the design work. And that's really where um, I think the, the benefits of um, CFD come in. If we move on just to um, the next slide for engineering considerations, um, again, just going back through the scale of what we're doing, we already touched on the fact that we, we've spent about, or we will have spent about 240 million pounds on the campus. So these are big, big, big investments, um, attract high grade investors, um, but they're producing large amounts of um, IT power, so that 40 megawatts. But I think what's quite interesting is looking at what that drives in the wider economy. Um, you know, inside the, the data center itself, we'll probably have three times that value um, uh, in terms of IT equipment. Um, and that in itself is very difficult to quantify in terms of what it brings to the rest of the, the economy. So it's obviously IT production, software writing, people like future facilities, for instance, uh, in the design process. Um, you know, if I look at the people involved on one of these projects, typically in the design phase, you may have sort of 50 people involved. At the peak in construction, you might have 150 people on site. Um, and even after we've handed over the keys, um, we've still probably got uh, 100 people involved on a day-to-day -day basis. In the background, some of them uh, maintaining the equipment, arriving on site, um, even down to sort of pest control. So, you know, a huge number of people can be involved. Uh, one project in particular, we had about 160 people in the design phase. Um, so in terms of contracts, you know, we, we place one design and build contract, but what we don't see is everything sort of down the road from that. So uh, there may be 50 subcontractors beyond that um, delivering little pieces of the, the puzzle. And just to round up this slide, um, what does the, the revenue look like? Now, it looks really quite um, healthy there. You've got 60 million per building, because we've got four buildings, so that's the 240. But per building, we're perhaps looking in the region of about 150 million uh, pounds return. Um, however, 
bear in mind that some of that has to be offset against interest and um, dividends and so on. So it's not quite as straightforward, but as you can see, uh, a huge sort of scale. Um, if we move on, um, in terms of the further considerations, I, I guess, you know, regulation and responsibilities are, are what I'd just sort of draw on. The first one, of course, is the responsibility for health and safety. Um, you know, it's no good building uh, a data center like this that's fantastic and enables the modern world if the people building it don't go home at night. So um, that's a key thing, and that's in terms of building it in the first place, but also maintaining it going forward. So huge emphasis put on health and safety. Um, monitoring and due diligence. Um, effectively, we need to make sure that the the data center does what it says on the tin. You know, if we're selling a service, we're selling what we call a, an SLA, a service level agreement. Uh, we need to make sure that the, the temperature of the air going to the server is what we say it will be, the amount of power is what it will be, um, and it keeps the IT running. Um, so we have lots of um, reporting systems, BMSs, building management systems, energy management systems, um, and what you can see there on the left-hand um, picture is our network control center um, looking at individual cabs, going up to looking at complete systems, electrical switchboards. Um, and it's all basically to ensure that the delivery of the systems is in line with the ASHRAE. And for those of you, I'm sure you, you all do know, um, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers guidelines uh, for operating computer equipment. Um, they have a committee called TC 9.9. .9, and they develop these zones that you can see within the psychometric chart. Um, and that basically, if we can support that, uh, we can keep our uh, computers in business. With that, I will um, hand over to Al, I think, um, before I rabbit on too long about that and um, get into the nitty gritty of uh, what we're discussing. Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the search for efficiency um, and where the the energy actually goes. So I guess the first question um, is what is all of that energy actually needed to do? And at face value, you might think that the power goes into a data center and you get data coming out of the data center and it's as simple as that. Um, it might not be immediately clear that actually all of the power that goes into the data center is converted to heat. And for the data center to continue, the heat must be removed. So uh, two major points there. Now, if we look a bit um, further into the energy usage, uh, you can see usually, as presented on the slide, uh, the two biggest demands are the IT and the cooling. Uh, computers convert all of the energy they use into heat, and the cooling systems then take that heat away. In doing that, they use more energy and that generates more heat. And energy is also used elsewhere in the process. Uh, in the power delivery, for example, you get even more energy loss as heat, although these losses are much smaller in comparison to the previous two. Um, the ratio for the total power supplied to the data center compared to the power that you actually need just for the IT is called the power usage effectiveness, which is the PUE, and lower is better. And 15 years ago, typically the PUE was about 2.5. It wasn't really measured back then though. Um, and now it looks to be the average of about 1.67. And when you're looking at the real leading edge state-of-the-art state hyperscale data centers, and these are massive data centers with uh, very similar IT running throughout the entire hall, um, so they benefit from economies of scale. The PUE can be 1.1 or lower. So that's industry best. So in summary, what we're saying is we used to require more than double the IT's power to run a data center. Uh, and now it takes only about two thirds of the IT's energy on top on average. So it might seem like an obvious question to ask, where should we aim to save this energy? Uh, the answer really is everywhere to some extent. Uh, all the technologies that are involved are evolving, um, 
but the cooling system can often be a, a good place to find some real gains. Uh, the IT power is obviously fixed by customer demand. They decide what is going in and also how many computers are going in. Um, and that ultimately determines the, the cooling required. But if the cooling can be achieved efficiently, then you can make a big difference to the overall data center power requirements. Uh, this will also reduce the associated losses with power delivery um, through the equipment such as the transformers. So reducing energy usage anywhere has knock-on effects in reducing energy usage in other places. So Gerard, uh, with that said, does it make sense to talk about the power delivery system? Yep, absolutely. Um, happily take that over. Oh, sorry. Has it skipped? Skipped forward there. Um, okay. As we, as you said um, quite eloquently there, Al, the, um, the the biggest sort of jumps forwards are uh, in the cooling uh, sort of um, side of the things. But it's important to look at the, the power systems that are in there. Um, ultimately, keeping the computers up and running it requires electricity to be there 24-7, 870 hours of the year uh, without fail. Um, and the, the key is that sort of uninterrupted 100% uptime. What we've got on screen there is one of several possible solutions for power. Um, in the last 20 years, that really hasn't changed that much, um, in, in my view. Um, and what you do try to do is limit the number of transformations. So we come off the grid into a mains transformer. Um, we may have another transformation stage further down the line, depending on the, uh, the, the voltage of the system. But you know, potentially two levels of uh, transformation. We've got generators generating power. We've then got UPSs um, feeding uh, distribution switch panels that feed out power to the IT equipment itself um, through PDUs. Um, sometimes those have isolation transformers in, which is, is further losses. So overall, um, within that, that sort of 1.67 PUE that we talked about, probably 0.12 of that is where the, the power uh, distribution um, sort of paths are. Um, and there's very little incremental difference that we can make to that these days. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, <laughs> we are where we are. Um, if we um, look at what is happening in the, the actual IT space, uh, we're seeing increased demand for energy uh, in, in smaller and smaller spaces. And I, I think I'll probably hand over to you because this is where your expertise really comes into play um, and, and how uh, really the, the issue about airflow uh, comes into uh, a real sort of factor in our design for cooling systems. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks, Gerard. Um, so, well, I'll just explain what you're looking at on the screen. Um, you're looking at a row of computers, uh, otherwise, otherwise known as servers, um, and they're all stacked up on top of one another in, in what we call racks or cabinets. Um, and to give you an idea of the size of a data center, uh, a single data hall could, uh, or some, sorry, a, a data center could contain over 100 of, of these rows that you're looking at. Um, and the image actually shows, this image actually shows an example of NVIDIA's DGX Superpod, um, and you can find out about that online. Uh, the system is installed at KO Data and it actually forms the Cambridge, Cambridge One supercomputer. Um, and these, these cabinets or these racks on this slide each equate to about 35 kilowatts of heat. So this entire row in the image is uh, just under 600 kilowatts of power being used and or, or heat being created is the other way of looking at it. Um, so really that creation of heat starts here and it must be managed from this point forwards it's very important to get rid of that heat cleanly um, and actually you have to think about the the movement of the heat all the way to leaving the vicinity of the site so if we take a better look at the infrastructure uh, responsible for managing this heat on the next slide um, what we can see uh, in the image is a, a data center on the right, uh, mechanical cooling in the middle, and then uh, the great outdoors. 
um, which we're allowed to see again nowadays, so that's good. Um, yeah. And uh, historically, it's worth being aware that IT equipment did require low temperature um, and inlets required on mechanical cooling. So IT inlets needed cold air from mechanical cooling, which is basically refrigeration. Um, as IT evolved, the temperatures didn't need to be so low, but they stayed low as a bit of a belt, belt and braces approach um, to maintaining the safety of the equipment in the room. But at the same time, IT power densities were lower, and so was the overall cooling demand. So the, the effects of this safe approach weren't entirely obvious. Um, but the mechanical systems do allow for crude heat management. If any of the servers in your data hall were hot, any single server was hot, you could just lower the temperature of the entire hall um, and, and safely return those servers back to uh, acceptable temperatures. But it's an expensive operation um, and, and a wasteful approach doing it that way. Yeah, indeed. Um, but I think one thing that's important to sort of flag here is that um, back 20 years ago, people didn't have what we call air management within the, the computer rooms. So um, cool air was sort of blown into the room and it was allowed to freely mix with the, the waste heat, um, which, which actually makes for a, not a very efficient sort of operation. So I guess that's one of the things that's come out of the, the ASHRAE uh, TC 9.9 .9 is that um, we've actually looked to sort of take inlet temperatures um, higher, so into the server equipment. So sort of standardizing in a, a mid band between 18 and 27, somewhere around 24, maybe 25 degrees. Um, and to ensure that we deliver air at that, uh, which allows us sort of free cooling opportunities, um, we need to make sure that the, the heat that's picked up across the IT equipment um, stays contained until it's rejected outside into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, we do that by having um, either hot aisle containment or cold aisle containment. And generally in this day and age, the best practice we, we find is to stay with hot aisle containment. So we contain all of that hot air exhaust from the IT equipment, pass it back to the cooling equipment externally, uh, and then before it's recycled into the data hall, um, it's cooled back down to 24 degrees. Um, you know, I think those, those guidelines have really sort of enabled us to take advantage of um, free cooling, as we call it, or, or certainly getting rid of refrigeration. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned the uh, Cambridge One supercomputer with the NVIDIA servers. So just to give people a, a little bit of a guide as to um, what we've got at um, the campus with 40 megawatts, um, effectively, um, that gives us the ability for about 7,000 IT racks across the complete estate. Um, the Cambridge One supercomputer, which is the, the sort of best in the country, uh, probably takes about 70 of those cabinets. So in effect, that 40 megawatts could probably power um, 100 supercomputers. So it sort of gives you some sort of scale um, of what we're, we're dealing with. Um, maybe I can pass back to you, Alan, and talk a bit more about cooling. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks, Rod. Um, so, well, as, as we're talking about containment, we I can um, let you know that we'll take a quick look at some containment in a couple of slides. Um, but I think that the important point I wanted to make um, in terms of this mechanical cooling here and the free cooling that we're we're going to uh, discuss in a second is that the the inlets that we've seen um, certainly in my line of, of business. Um, I've seen the inlets go from maybe 13 degrees uh, on average uh, all the way up to 25. So we've seen, you know, over 10 degrees C rise. Um, and that, of course, has a knock on effect to the IT outlets, which have gone from the mid 20s to the high 30s. Um, and that's that's quite important to enable the next step of, of this process in terms of reviewing efficiency. Uh, because what we wanted to do here is remove the mechanical cooling component. Um, 
Now for the highest efficiency, the IT inlets really need to be hotter than the external ambient conditions. Um, then the heat naturally wants to travel from the inside to the outside. And that's the fundamental requirement, just to re remove heat from, from the room. Um, so with IT, acceptable IT inlets increased, uh, that means that external ambient temperatures are now often cold enough to supply that IT um, and it can be used without the need for mechanical cooling and doing this is called free cooling um, as you just mentioned uh, and there are two types of free cooling there's direct and indirect. Uh, direct free cooling means the outside air is used to cool the equipment di uh, <laughs> directly uh, but it requires me mechanical backup um, for example, in the case of uh, contaminated air outside in the environment. Um, so you'd have to shut the data center off to the external air and then start uh, mechanically cooling the internal air. Whereas indirect um, means that the inside and the outside air streams are kept separate and they are thermally connected by what we call an air to air heat exchanger. Um, and this approach is safer because contamination is not a risk um, not only do you have to not revert to um, mechanical backup, but generally you're not worried about bringing in um, dirt and debris from outside. Um, and also generally there is no need for humidity control because the internal air is kept separate. Um, you might wonder what happens if the ambient air is slightly too warm. So if, it, if the ambient air in a, on a particular day or in a particular environment is slightly too warm, then we can actually pre-cool that um, in, in a method that we call adiabatic cooling. Um, and that technique lowers the external air temperature passively by evaporating water into it before it runs through the heat exchanger. So we just make the outside air cooler by making it uh, more humid. Um, and yeah, this is of course location and season dependent. And even then there's a day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour variation in in the weather so this approach is is really good for northern europe some parts of the us uh, some of australia but then you do have um, questions around water availability in some locations so it's it's very much uh, a solution that needs to be considered uh, on a case-by-case -case basis um, and the other thing, the final comment to make is if you do remove that mechanical cooling, then you really reduce the margins for error because there is no chance for you to turn up your mechanical cooling if, uh, if conditions change. So um, the final piece of this puzzle, as Gerard was alluding to earlier on, um, is to make sure that the cool air reaches the IT inlets without being compromised along the way. Uh, what you're looking at here on this slide um, is one of the holes in KO data. Um, and the aim here is to keep the cold air separate from the hot air. Um, and Gerard was talking about hot air uh, containment. And there are various methods to physically segregate the hot and the cold air. Um, and I guess in the, the in layman's terms, in the simplest terms, it's, it's quite simply blanking panels uh, used to segregate the, the two air paths. Um, but you take away a temperature problem and instead you add a pressure balancing problem. Um, and in practice, anyway, when you build these things, there are always gaps and air will inevitably mix to some degree. Um, so actually keeping the hot air away from the IT inlets throughout the entire data center um, is harder than it might sound. Uh, this really is where CFD comes in handy um, and we, what we're talking about here is application specific CFD so CFD that's been um, tailored to the application of data center cooling and, and heat management um, and it simulates CFD fundamentally simulates air flows and, and heat transfer um, but being application specific we can combine the CFD um, with a simulation that includes the behavior of the equipment that's found in the data centers and along um, and also the control systems that are found in the data centers. So what we are actually doing is simulating many dynamic and interactive components 
uh, all concurrently until that system finds an equilibrium, if it can find an equilibrium. So sometimes we'll find that a design just doesn't work. Um, so to explain these images, the background image, uh, you're looking at the, the data hall in, in the KO Data Campus, uh, and you can see rows of cabinets running from the top to the bottom of the image. Um, and we also have a pressure plane being displayed, uh, red denoting the higher pressure and blue the lower pressure. So you can see the containment that's um, working because you have lower pressure zones separated from the higher pressure zones in this hall. In the zoomed in section in the foreground, you can see arrows showing the flow paths within the area, um, within that little area. And you can see um, cool air having to twist around the edge uh, of a cabinet and the pressure variation that comes with that. So you can see how you've got a lower pressure region as you run through into that aisle, um, as the air has to navigate its way through. So uh, it was, Ultimately, it was important to simulate and validate the effectiveness of the internal design like this because um, KO data would then have uh, confidence um, that without mechanical cooling, they, they would be able to operate safely. Uh, the next piece of the puzzle is the external side. And what you're looking at here is the IECs or the indirect evaporative cooling units that sit on the outside of the data hall. Um, we've got some air streams being displayed and uh, they are colored by the wet bulb temperature. So you're looking at dry air going in and then humid air coming out. Now it's important to um, recognize that this system had to be designed to survive worst case conditions. Um, and to do that, we reviewed the historical weather from ASHRAE, which is a, a standard source for these kind of designs. Um, and the worst case ambient was 34 and a half degrees C and uh, about 37% relative humidity. And that meant that adiabatic cooling was going to be operational. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point that most of the year round, the, the system actually runs on dry cooling, so there's no water being added to the air, um, and that's when the ambient is cool enough, uh, which is usually October to April, um, and then you've got some transition months that fall either side, um, and during these months, water might only be used um, at the peak conditions during the day, so between maybe 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, but what we're looking at here is the design in the worst case conditions. Um, and I thought it was important to uh, talk through every mechanical engineering student's favorite chart, which is the psychrometric chart. Um, the blue dot on this chart, where it says ambient, represents the external air. Um, and the green dot is the IEC exhaust. And that actually, you might be surprised if, if you're familiar with this chart or if you can read the numbers, um, you might be surprised to, to note that um, the IEC exhaust is actually cooler, um, but it's much more humid. So overall, the energy contained within the air or the enthalpy of the air is higher. And in this state, it cannot be reused. It can't re-enter an IEC. What actually happens inside the IEC is the ambient air is saturated. Um, and that means that the the ambient uh, that blue dot the ambient dot um, moves left and upwards along the wet bulb line towards the saturation point and um, moving left and up along the chart means that um, whilst the wet bulb stays the same the dry bulb temperature actually drops and we go all the way from about 34 and a half degrees to 23 um, and then as the data center heat uh, heats up the air as it as heats up the external air as it runs through the IEC, um, we start to um, add some energy and raise the dry bulb temperature. But at the same time, we evaporate a bit more water and the, the, the end result is that we end up slightly cooler, but way more humid. It's key that this IEC exhaust air is removed from the site. So what we really do need to do is make sure that it's either removed completely or sufficiently mixed to 
bring it back below the red line. What we can see here is the external model. And this is what we use to tell us um, that the, the site was going to work in advance of, of being built. Um, you can imagine that a trial and error approach would be very costly, it would be prohibitively slow and it would be expensive. Um, and you can't really build the site and then edit it afterwards, or well, not very conveniently. Uh, so we ran an external simulation uh, and demonstrated how that site would behave in different wind conditions. So what you're looking at on this slide um, is the air approaching the IECs on the front side of the building from behind the building. Uh, the color of the air is again uh, representing the wet bulb temperature. Um, and you can see some mixing with the exhaust air as that air uh, comes over the top of the building and into the ICs. But what the simulation showed was that although that was unavoidable, um, the air entering the ICs was actually below the, the wet bulb limits. We can look at this model from another angle. So we're looking at the same thing, but from the back, and you can see um, that on this side of the building with the ICs uh, in place, uh, as the air approaches the building, it's uninterrupted um, and it runs straight into the IECs uh, and is ejected over the roof um, and away from the building. Uh, and there's a, a third way to, to look at this that we've got for you here. And that is from the top um, and it's it all looks red, it all looks very hot, but what we're actually looking at here is a result plane. Um, that represents the dry bulb temperature. And uh, that means that everything that's red is, is 34 and a half degrees. Um, and we know that in this environment, um, anything that's colder than that is co cooler only because water has been evaporated into it from the IEC. So what we can tell from this plot um, is the concentration really of the, of the exhaust air from the IECs and the direction of the the bulk movement away from the site. So it's uh, quite a useful plane to understand those kind of things. Um, we did run a number of different wind and load conditions like this to assess the building's cooling performance. The results of the simulations were used to fine tune the design before it was constructed. Uh, and the end result is a data center facility, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gerard, but I think it's got a maximum PUE of 1.2, um, and it houses, amongst other things, one of the UK's most powerful supercomputers. Indeed, yes, uh, 1.2 is, is where we're benchmarked at, so way, way, way better than the 2.5 of yesteryear. Yeah, brilliant. Um, well, I think that takes me to the end of my section. Right. Well, I think I probably should apologise for rabbiting on too much about my part of the, um, uh, the presentation and overriding some of the time spent uh, on your, which is um, far more interesting. But um, I think what it does show um, uh, is that we can all do this better um, and we should all be doing this better. Um, we're all um, guardians of the environment, or we should be, in our engineering approach. It should be part of our code of... Uh, practice and ethics and um, we should all be looking to um, reduce carbon inputs, reduce materials usage, uh, reduce cost as well uh, and um, obviously uh, if we can do that by driving up efficiency and, and this tool enables it, I think it's um, absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, we're going to be publishing a case study about this project which is due to be posted on our website in May. Um, and I think that takes us to the end. So thanks for joining. Thank you very much, Alex and Gerard. Um, that was a very interesting presentation. And you've clearly had an engaged audience based on the number of questions coming through. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a couple of questions from Manjun. Um, and I'm going to phrase them towards both of you. Um, so the question is, uh, what is the average operating temperature of the equipment in the data center? And what is the allowable humidity? Um, 
I'd ask Alex to first address this from like an ASHRAE generic guidelines point of view, and then Gerard, if you can talk about how these relate to KO data specifically. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Uh, well, talking about ASHRAE, so the, the guidelines that recommend the temperatures, um, we're talking about a range uh, of recommended temperatures of 18 to 27 degrees Celsius at the inlets. Um, so a fairly wide range and, and also reasonably warm. Um, so that's uh, that's really what enables a lot of these approaches to, to take place and um, the relative humidity uh, guidelines are very very wide um, I think I think for recommended it's it's not actually stipulated but in terms of allowable so once you're outside the recommended range there's an allowable range um, and relative humidity um, is, is listed as 8 to 80 percent and for the in that temperature to the equipment is 15 to 32 degrees Celsius, so it's even wider. Um, and, and you're allowed to run into those ranges for sh short amounts of time. And um, I think the key point there um, is whilst there is a wide operating band, and that's sort of really been driven by um, a lot of sort of green bodies. I, I remember talking to um, planners in Amsterdam back in 1998 asking why we needed such cold rooms for our data centers. Um, <clears throat> the key thing with humidity is to make sure obviously we don't get anything that condenses. Um, so yeah, it's a very wide range, um, but what we can't have is obviously uh, water um, forming on any of the circuit boards because that would have a, a devastating effect for the, um, the servers themselves. And that's the key that we're trying to keep moving. Um, I'm not sure if that covers it completely. That sounds great. Thanks, Jared. The next question is from Roy, um, and this is about, um, I guess, redundancy. So do you have an electrical power system controller or controllers uh, which can also protect against outages? And um, so I think I'll put that towards Jared in the context of care. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks, Mario. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, the, the first line of defense, um, because you can never predict what the, the grid power is actually going to do, is that we have the UPSs there. Um, and um, we have that on generally on two feeds to a, a server. That's where we get the resilience. So it's a, a dual redundant system. So two sets of UPSs. Uh, if one goes offline, you've got the other one to keep it up. And the power supplies are generally common within the server uh, at DC level. Um, beyond the UPSs though, uh, if we have a break in supply um, to the site, um, we have a, a series of backup generators uh, that work. Um, and to control all of that, uh, we generally have a sort of SCADA system, PLC based system, again, which is hot standby, uh, usually with a, a sort of fiber heartbeat link between the two so that if one system fails the other one picks up and that will monitor all of the um, signals on the site going forwards and um, switching generators when we need them if the mains has failed uh, and, and take a, a sort of set of um, preordained pre routes based on certain circumstances. Brilliant. Um, the next question I'm going to put to Alex because he was talking to us about the psychometrics um, from Frankie. Uh, I'm always confused with RH and dew point temperature. Could you please explain their differences? Uh, yeah, sure can. Um, it is confusing. I get confused. I still get confused <laughs> looking at this stuff. Um, you think you've got it all straight in your head and then you just talk yourself out of it at some point. But the, the relative humidity, uh, that's the amount of moisture or water um, evaporated into the air um, at a given temperature compared to the amount of water that you're uh, able to evaporate into that air. So um, it's the, the relative part is referencing um, the saturation limit. So how much water can you get in the air for a given temperature 
and then if you've got half of that then the relative humidity is 50 percent at, at that temperature um i think the next part of the question was about the dew point so the dew point is um if you have some air with a given amount of moisture in it um then the dew point temperature is the temperature at which if if the air is to reduce in temperature the temperature at which water will start to condense out of that air because the saturation uh, point drops as temperature as the temperature of the air gets colder so hopefully that clears that up and if i could just add to that alex that's one of the reasons why um, we've selected an indirect cooling system um, so there's a place heat exchanger between the external and internal air stream is so that we can keep an eye and control that humidity um, we probably sacrifice a very small amount of efficiency for having the plate heat exchanger there but what we then do is um, we're in complete control of the humidity of the air whereas if we use direct fresh air uh, we're out of control um, and actually at certain times of the year if you put equipment in to dehumidify or humidify that air um, actually that can use huge amounts of power that would then offset the the reduction of efficiency of having the plate heat exchanger uh, in circuit. Thank you both. Um, the next one does, I think, relate more to a facility like KO's. So, a question from James is, how much water will an IEC system consume, for example, for a UK 40 megawatt data center? Um, could you please give a ballpark figure? Yeah, I can certainly give a ballpark figure. I, and I guess whatever figure I get, there'll, there'll be someone who thinks that um, it, it's probably outrageous. Um, if I look at it per megawatt of capacity on our site, um, if in the, the, the worst or the hottest 24 hour period, um, each megawatt probably um, consumes something like 15,000 litres of water. Um, which sounds like a lot, that's 15 metres cubed. However, what I would say is, is to counter that, so if per megawatt 15,000 litres, we're, we're talking probably 600,000 litres for a 40 megawatt campus. So it does sound like a lot of water. However, what you need to remember is that the amount of energy we're saving by using this rather than using refrigeration that would use twice as much at least on the, the, the sort of power overhead to, to cause the same amount of cooling. Um, at the power station, that could be using 95 litres per kilowatt, so uh, 95,000 litres per um, megawatt. So, you, you know, the, there's actually a huge holistic reduction by doing it at point of use on site rather than doing it at the power station. Um, so hopefully that goes some way to placating the, the sort of uh, green people and it is really part of our focus uh, of looking at this thing holistically it's it, it it's actually focus on what the overall system uh, is um, and the other point to remember of course is that water is evaporated and at least it falls again as rain somewhere we're not destroying it so it's not like a carbon fuel um, we've actually got some um, we can recapture that and, and reuse it Brilliant. And I think you've started to uh, hit on like the next question. We've actually had a couple of questions in um, about heat recovery. Uh, so this mm. one's from Declan. Um, the hot air being removed from the data center, is it just being released to the outdoors as waste energy? Um, or is this being recycled? Um, for example, could it be used to heat local offices? And I guess I'd like to ask this not just from the perspective of KO, but also other facilities around the world. Yeah, and nothing would make my heart sing uh, greater than to be able to do that. Um, we are, um, we, we've looked at pilot schemes to do that. Um, and if you work in different zones in uh, Northern Europe, then there are facilities in place to be able to do that. So if you go into the Nordics, um, a lot of countries there um, have um, district heating systems in place. Um, and it becomes quite straightforward then to uh, put a plate heat exchanger between your facility 
and the district heating system and disperse that energy. There's always difficulty in actually agreeing um, a cost mechanism as commercials around uh, what that, that the value of that heat is. Um, in the UK, it, it's more of a difficult solution because very few places have any district heating uh, schemes in in um, function, you know, in in place. Um, but it's something we would dearly like to do. Um, so at the moment, yes, the, the the heat does go out, but we've used the the most efficient way of removing that heat. Um, but it would be great to be able to uh, recycle that heat uh, and put it in. Um, the other consideration is, of course, that as the data center is just starting to grow, you've got very little heat output. If you, you set a contract in place with someone to use that heat, you've got to be able to guarantee that that heat is there for them to use. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation there, but um, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's certainly the way we should be looking at digital cities uh, and linking those two things together, uh, sort of part of our vision, really. Thanks, Todd. Um, the next question I'm going to put to Alex, and this is from David. Um, he's saying, assuming for the foreseeable future, the IT will operate ever hotter, but always require heat removal. Is there any merit or future in developments with chip or IT designers in enabling liquid cooling? Um, for example, high-end gaming PC with overclocked chips use a limited form of localized liquid cooling. I'm aware that we could potentially do an entire webinar on this subject, um, but in a minute or so, Alex, is that one you'd like to take? Yeah, I mean, it's it's actively being researched, it's being deployed. Um, if you look at the news, you'll see um, various approaches taken to using liquid cooling, um, immersion cooling, so just systems sat in big vats of the fluid, um, and then pipings um, or pipework systems where you're kind of supplying the, the fluid to the top of the chip um, and then taking that away. Um, and, and dealing with it through a, a more of a traditional mechanical cooling system. Um, it is necessary, especially for the very, very high density equipment that we're moving towards. Um, it's, it, you could consider it essential um, due to the heat densities. Uh, I think it's also worth considering um, when, you, when you're dealing with those kind of densities, even if you have a small percentage of heat loss to air, the number, the, the absolute value of that heat um, being lost to the air is still significant. So it's um, it would be a combination approach of air cooling and, and liquid cooling that would be necessary. Um, but you you don't need to supply the cold cold temperatures um, that we were talking about at the start of the webinar. If you're if you're specifically um, directing that that cool fluid to where the heat is needed. So again, you can make use of efficient chillers and efficient mechanical cooling um, uh, technology whilst achieving the heat removal that you need. And if I could squeeze two seconds on the end of that, um, if, if we do do more uh, liquid cooling, which is still in its infancy uh, in reality, commercially anyway, um, that makes it easier actually to have heat reuse and ship it off site because we get higher grade um, heat uh, in water rather than um, low grade heat in air that we have to recover. So, yeah, dual benefit. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be made available for future viewing. Um, but for now, a huge thank you to Gerard and Alex, uh, to the iMechE production team as well and to you, our audience, for joining us today. Um, have a lovely afternoon and stay safe. Thank you.